Get your ass in there before I call Carrie in. Yes, sir. <laughs> Make me call Carrie in. I'm about to put in a ticket. <laughs> What's going on guys? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Unique Experience. Today I'm gonna to share with you uh, my latest and newest experience. Made up my mind, trick it happy, don't stop. Reckless a fool, it's gonna sound like a pop. Small town city dreams, now life is a scene. Gonna grab your attention, make it rain, make it rain. Grab your attention, make All right, guys, once again, thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Unique Experience, part of the Fujibo Heavy channel. If you're new to the channel, my name is John. My personal goal is to own and experience as many unique cars as possible. If you're already subscribed, thanks again for tuning in. So without further ado, guys, I wanted to share with you my replacement for the uh, Maserati Gran Turismo MC. Uh, this is my 2016 BMW M4. So um, to kind of give you a little backstory as to kind of what's been going on, obviously I sold the Maserati. Uh, the Maserati was a really nice car. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a really good looking car. Uh, it sounds amazing uh, and it's very comfortable. It's a grand touring car. Uh, but I was looking for something a little bit more different. Um, and in mine, I did have grand touring cars for this year. That was going to be my hyper focus. Um, but obviously things did not work out that way. Um, basically how it works is I'll have my eye on certain things, but it really all comes down to what's available when I'm looking and you know what makes uh, the most sense for me and kind of like the best deal I guess you could say. So um, if you're wondering kind of what made me choose the M4, uh, as I mentioned before it's not really something that I was looking for but uh, a couple good friends um, you know that uh, I, I've spent a lot of time with we all used to own E46 M3s back in the day and uh, you know um, they both had Interlagos blue E46 M3s I had a Laguna Seca blue 03 E46 M3 and that's how we all met and one of them currently has a secure orange F82 M4 the other one recently picked up an F80 M3 and after being around it you know I started looking at them a little bit closer and said you know what I think that this would be a really good platform to look into so um you know, I, I was actually between this car and a San Marino Blue M6. Uh, this car was actually local, and by local I mean it was within the state of Maryland. Um, you know, met the owner, talked to her, negotiated a price, and picked it up. So, um, to go over, I guess you could say, uh, the specs of the car and all the details, uh, the exterior color is tanzanite blue metallic, and the interior is nutmeg. Um, the thing that I told myself, or if you guys know me or follow the channel, you know I historically tend to veer towards things that are older and more special, I guess you could say, or something that's like really unique. So, um, you know, a car that retailed for over 100,000 you can buy now for a fraction of the price as opposed to looking at newer cars. And by newer, I mean this is a 16, it's still, you know, six years old still, so, um, but still that's new to me. I've never really owned a car this new. I think the newest car I've ever owned was was either the Maserati or an X5 that we had, and that was 2012s. They were both 2012s. Otherwise, all the stuff that I've ever owned was older. But anyway, um, I told myself if I'm gonna get something that is a little more common, I would at least like to have a more uncommon color combination. Uh, so Tanzanite blue is awesome. Blue is my favorite color. And what's really nice is when the sun is not directly on it, it looks like a dark navy. Uh, but when the sun hits it, it's actually like a bright metallic blue, kind of like San Marino. Um, it, so it's, it's cool because you get best of both worlds. You kind of get that dark blue with also the bright blue, depending on how the light is hitting it. Um, as I mentioned, the interior also has nutmeg. So nutmeg is like this kind of medium brown. It's not quite like a, you know, like a sport glove brown, like a dark brown. Um, but it's also not really light. It's kind of right in between um, with the Merino extended leather. So it has the leather dash, uh, leather on the panels and everything like that. Um, so far, uh, as far as the 
driving experience of the car, it's been a phenomenal car. Um, with these platforms, the S55 engine is pretty stout. Uh, like all cars, uh, they have their Achilles heels and um, I guess I'll go into that a little bit later, but overall, I mean, this car really offers a lot, especially for the money and the price point um, of it. So uh, I guess what I'll do is I'll go ahead and jump into the, uh, you know, the modifications that are done to this car and uh, everything like that. So uh, to start underneath the hood, uh, the previous owner had done uh, CTS intakes, it has catalyst downpipes, mid pipe, J pipe, so essentially a full exhaust system. Uh, and I believe it has a boot mode stage two tune as well. Um, you know, from the factory, they're pretty fast, uh, but you know, especially for me, I'm not really one to care that much about you know, going super fast and having a ton of power. Um, but this car power wise is definitely comparable to the 911 turbo that I had modified 911 turbo at that. Um, so it's definitely pretty quick. Um, so that's under the hood, uh, to jump to the, uh, exterior. I have uh, carbon fiber kidney grills uh, that I added. It has carbon fiber upper canards, carbon fiber lower splitters, and then the front lip was actually all carbon fiber. It's a PSM style lip. Uh, and what I did in an attempt to kind of break up all the carbon that was going on up front is I had my painter do a cutoff line right here and do like a partial color match and leave the um, like kind of the center of it exposed carbon. So it was a really good way to kind of break up all the carbon and add some contrast to the front end without fully color matching the entire carbon front lip. Cause you know, realistically, at least for me, I like carbon, obviously it's lightweight, uh, but it's the aesthetic value that it brings is, you know, why I like it, I like the weave. So that's pretty much the front end. Um, you have carbon fiber mirror caps, carbon fiber PSM side skirt extensions. The car does have a carbon fiber roof. It has a carbon fiber uh, antenna cover. Uh, as we walk around to the back, it also has a carbon fiber rear diffuser. It has these rear corner valance covers in the back as well that are carbon. Um, one of my favorite mods on this car uh, is the taillights. They're VLANs OLED GTS taillights and the startup sequence on them is everything. It's really cool how pretty much when you unlock it, you know, the, the lights come out and then they go back in and then they slowly come out and go back into place. It's definitely really cool. It's almost like art. Um, but it also has a carbon fiber um, wing and then it has, um, I put black exhaust tips on there. Uh, as you guys know, I love carbon, uh, but I do feel like there is such thing as overdoing things. And you know, when you have too much carbon going on at once, it kind of gets lost. So as much as I wanted to do like the M carbon tips, I ended up just finding like a really clean looking black exhaust tip uh, that is slightly larger than OEM, but it looks just so much cleaner and I think it really completes the look of it. Um, this car does have the uh, comfort access feature, which is where you keep the key fob in your pocket. And then basically you can just, you know, press the button to, to lock it, which it is uh, actually, I don't have the key fob with me. So crap, let me go grab that. So I have the key fob. And as I mentioned, the car does have the keyless go uh, feature. So, or comfort access, I guess is what they call it. You, so you just keep the key fob in your pocket and what you can do is just touch it and uh, you know, when you do that, it'll obviously lock it. And then when you put your hand behind there, it'll unlock. Um, so as we jump into the interior, uh, I did add a bunch of carbon fiber trim pieces. So the car from the factory had some factory carbon. Uh, so I tried my best to try to find pieces that would match the, the factory finish and then the factory weave. Uh, when buying aftermarket carbon, you have to be very careful. Um, a lot of the times, uh, especially if you're buying from a source like eBay, things of that nature, um, you know, sometimes they'll advertise uh, like a carbon fiber real, they'll use like a picture with real carbon. And then when you go to the description, it says like carbon fiber, look or you know carbon fiber design or something like that and realistically it's like a hydro dip you know hydro dip product that kind of looks similar to carbon but it's not actual carbon um, 
so all the trim pieces that I added, I tried my best to, to get them to match. They're all, de they're all definitely not perfect, but as close as possible that I could do. So um, I added carbon fiber trim on the steering wheel, carbon paddles. Um, there's also like another trim piece around the steering wheel that is carbon fiber that I, uh, that I changed. Um, e-brake handle, radio trim bezel, and just kind of random pieces in carbon. Um, but aside from that, that is pretty much it as far as like, uh, like modifications to the car. So far, my impression is uh, it's a great car. I mean, this is a daily drivable like, I don't want to say it's a supercar, right? Because it really all kind of, uh, you know, depends on your definition of, of supercar. But uh, I think that you just get a lot of car for the money uh, with these. And like I said, they're completely daily drivable. I mean, they have tons of technology in it. Um, it's extremely comfortable. And it's just a very customizable platform. Like, there are so many parts and things that you can change on these cars to kind of make it your own. Um, driving experience-wise, you know, um, it is definitely comfortable. It, it, it can be like a regular car if you want it to be, and it can be a beast if you want it to be. So, you know, if I'm, I'm just running up the road or running errands or whatever around, uh, and I want to be a little more low key, I guess you could say, um, I would just leave it in the efficient mode and have the suspension on comfort, have everything on comfort. So it's relatively quiet uh, and it's very comfortable. But if for whatever reason, you know, I'm feeling like I want to do a little more spirited, uh, engaged uh, engaged driving, I guess you could say, um, you know, you can turn on the, the M1 or M2 and you can customize those features within itself uh, to basically, you know, have what you want M1 to be. So if you want M1 to be, you know, Sport Plus, uh, you know, feature on with the the Titan suspension and all those things um, you know you can set it to those features but uh, the exhaust valves definitely open up when you I have it set to um, you know when you do turn on like M1 it does open up the exhaust valves and that's kind of the beauty of this particular car is you know if you do change the mufflers like it does have a full exhaust like um, you know well it has catalyst downpipes, midpipe, J-pipe, uh, but still factory mufflers. So what's really cool is you still get to keep that valve feature. So uh, the valve feature just means that, you know, it can be nice and quiet. So in the morning when I'm going to Cars and Coffee, if I have to get up super early, you know, it's not super loud and distracting. Um, so I can get out pretty quickly. And then later on, once the car is warmed up and stuff, if I want to open it up, you know, at that point you can turn on the button and, and, and wake, in, wake in the car up, turn it into something completely different. But um, so so far it is a great car I mean it's definitely a very customizable platform uh, as I mentioned the s55 is very similar to the previous generation n54 the n54 is a very uh, customizable platform as well um, they respond very well to modifications but with that obviously once you start taking things um, to a certain point you know past what it was designed to do uh, eventually there will be you know problems or things that you'll have to upgrade down the road to to compensate for those modifications. Um, that's pretty much it for the car. Um, as far as like future plans, um, you know, if this is something that I end up keeping, you know, long term, I think uh, one of the things I want to do is um, have these headlight housings painted black. So, you know, if you look around the car, everything is dark, right? The paint, uh, the trim pieces, the wheels, uh, everything is all kind of uh, dark. And the only kind of light thing that sticks out are the headlights. And if you look inside the housing, you can see like the, the back part of the headlight housing is black, but the front of it is, is chrome. So uh, there's a lot of companies that you can send your headlights out to and they can take them apart and do all kinds of customizing. You can change the halo shape and colors and all these different things. For me, I, I like 
everything lighting wise uh, with the headlights. Uh, I just want the housing aesthetically to be black because I think it'll really tie in well with all the other dark accents on the car. Um, so I, I believe your options are, you know, Bay Optics. Um, there is a company called Mod Emporium that a friend of mine had his headlights done. They look great. Um, a part of me does want to kind of try and take them apart myself and try to do it because uh, my brother Bo and I, we have done, um, you know, we have taken headlights apart before. If you look through our YouTube videos back when I had my O2 Honda Accord, um, we took apart the, the headlight housings and retrofitted a projector in like a regular reflective housing headlight. But then again, you're talking about a, you know, pretty cheap headlight. I believe it was like 80 bucks for the pair shipped. So I have no idea how they're making pro profit, you know, but that just kind of maybe tells you a little bit about the quality that you're getting. Um, rather than these headlights where, you know, if secondhand, there'd probably be anywhere between 1500 to 2000 for, you know, um, a pair of them. So uh, still something I'm thinking about, not 100% sure if I want to do it. Um, but that is something that, you know, if I do end up keeping it, that is something that I would like to get done. And the only other thing that I'm thinking about um, is just a couple more interior trim pieces. Uh, I know that they make like a carbon fiber seat backing for it. I think that will kind of just kind of tie in the rest of the carbon accents together on the inside. Um, but that's not something that I really need at this time. Uh, I mean, realistically, we don't need any of this stuff, right? But um, that's pretty much it. Um, I also forgot to mention that uh, this car does have comp 20 inch competition wheels. Um, this is not a competition model. The competition model, from what I understand, has you know maybe a little bit more power than a standard uh, model M4. Um, I know that the seats are different. I know that the seat belts are different. Um, there are some aesthetic changes, but you know I'm not 100% sure of, of all of them. But uh, this does have the 20 inch. Uh, I, guess, I believe they call them the 666M wheels and uh, they were actually refinished by my wheel guy and uh, he did a really cool custom color. Initially I wanted to do bronze because I thought bronze would look really nice on blue. Um, but he actually did a custom satin finish for me, which I think is even better. Uh, so when the light is not directly on them, it actually has like a gunmetal look and the gunmetal color definitely flows with the carbon trim. So it makes the carbon pop. Um, but when the light is directly on the wheels, it, it actually has like a bronze finish you can see like a br uh, brown metallic so really cool custom color I love them um, I did have to replace the front tires uh, it had Michelin pilot sports uh, Michelin pilot super sports in the front but I did notice that the front passenger had like a bubble in it which is usually caused by some sort of blunt force uh, you know like maybe a big pothole or something like that um, but I, I ended up replacing both of them and in the back it does have Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's. So they're very similar uh, as far as performance wise, um, but you know, great tires. Um, so that's pretty much it uh, as far as, you know, the car, uh, the features, kind of why I bought it. Um, and kind of what my plans are for the future. So uh, the next step I'd say is uh, we should go ahead and we can go ahead and jump into the car and uh, we'll take it for a drive and we'll talk about, you know, kind of the, the driving experience and, and the different features for it. So let's go and jump into it. We are, uh, we're in the car with Bo. Um, just gonna kind of talk about, you know, the driving experience and kind of what it's like, you know, driving the M4. Um, you know, so, so what I really like about this car, and I know I've mentioned it before, is that, you know, this is 100% like a daily drivable car. Like right now when we're driving, I do have the car in like sport mode. So like the RPMs, everything like that is on sport, suspension's on sport, steering, everything's like on sport. So it's a little more responsive. Um, when you give it gas, it'll, you know, kind of, as you can hear that kick down, I have it in like drive right now. So it's kind of like it's automatic mode. So I'm not manually, you know, shifting it or anything like that. 
Um, but what I really like about this is, you know, I, I tend to go to like cars and coffee and things of that nature. I, I, I like to do those. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, to go to them, you got to get up pretty early, you know, like um, Katie's Cars and Coffee in Great Falls, Virginia is a huge one that I like going to just because the quality of the cars and everything. But, you know, to get there at a, you know, a decent hour to get a good parking spot, you got to leave. For me, I got to get up at like five, you know, sometimes even earlier than that and head that way because it is, you know, about an hour or so away. So, um... You know, when I start up the car in the morning, I do live in a townhome community, and I don't want to be, like, disruptive and stuff to, you know, the neighbors. So, what's really nice about it is, you know, if, if you have it, you know, not in M mode or anything like that, I just have it pretty much on, like, efficient and comfort. So, it's a very comfortable ride. Um, the valves, uh, this car has um, a pretty much a full exhaust, except for the muffler. So, it has... Um, intakes, it has a J-pipe, catalyst downpipes, mid-pipe, and then a tune. But it's still on factory mufflers, so I still get the valve option. So when I start up the car in the morning, <coughs> you know, it's, uh, it's not super loud. And then, you know, later on when I'm out of the neighborhood and the car's warmed up and everything, if I want it to be a little bit louder, you know, at that point I can kind of open up the valves and... Oh, you only do that after you leave the garage? I mean, obviously, sometimes if I know Bo doesn't like it because it's so loud. Like I can is, tell exactly the precise when, when second it, yeah. when you open it. Because it's like, da, 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 and I'm like, da. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, and I'm it's, like this. I'm like, I don't care, yeah. obviously. Well, but it's, 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 it's funny. audibly, it's, you know, audibly there's definitely a difference. Um, I think it'd be like, beneficial at the track because you can hear it better. So when you're shifting, like, you can. Yeah, so, so what's really cool is like, you know, um, it's loud when you want it to be, but then it's, you know, quiet when you want it to be, which is awesome. So you can really kind of control that. Um, one thing that I didn't talk about earlier that I think is definitely kind of important to mention is this is a, a DCT car. So um, for those who aren't familiar with what that is, it's a dual clutch transmission. And if you're kind of wondering what the difference is between like an automatic and a DCT transmission, um, if you're in an automatic car and you're sitting on a hill and you're in drive, when you let off the brake, that car is going to go forward. Uh, in a DCT car, if you're on a hill and you're in first or drive or whatever, um, and, and you uh, let off the gas, that car is actually going to roll back like an actual manual transmission. So basically what you have to do is just give it the right amount of gas so this way it can, uh, you'll feel a, a clutch engage, like an internal clutch engage. There's no physical clutch like a, you know, an actual manual. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll feel that engla engage. So at low speeds, um, it can be a little bit, you know, kind of clunky, especially if you have it in like M1 or M2 where it's a little more responsive and, uh, you know, kind of geared towards like, you know, a little more spirited or aggressive driving. Not aggressive driving, but like, you know, if you want to open it up or something like that. So it's really good for like, you know, high performance. Say you're wide open throttle. The DCT at like high speeds when you're on it is so responsive. I mean, it, it shifts faster than most people can in like a, a manual. Uh, but at lower speeds, it's just kind of like, you know, it, it's kind of jumpy. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, I guess, you can, yikes. <laughs> oh my God. Like, I got a fit, so I can't hate too much, but that's a little funny. But, you know, um, that's that's kind of one of, one of the really cool things about the DCT transmission. Overall, they are pretty stout, pretty solid, too. So, like, I know you love drive manuals. Yeah. How does this, does this feeling, I mean, DCT, if you had a choice between the two, it, even if you know DCT is faster, which would you choose? Um, so manual to me, I would, I would still prefer manual because it's just a completely different driving experience. It's uh, a lot more engaging when you, you know, have to engage the clutch and everything like that. You're definitely a lot more engaged with the car. Um, you know, in a DCT car, you know, you're just pressing a button or a paddle and it's going to do kind of the shifting for you and everything. But it's so, not as satisfying as actually clutching and throwing it in a gear. Yeah, I mean, my preference, I would prefer an actual manual car. Um, but, 
<coughs> I'd say that DCT is a very good, like, alternative to that. Like, um, you know, especially if it's something that, you know, say you drive into work a little more often or something like that, and you sit in traffic and stuff like that, it's, you know, you don't have to deal with the actual clutch. But as I mentioned before, sometimes at lower speed, if you do have it in, like, a, you know, a sportier mode or something, it kind of, like, it's kind of, like, jumpy. Uh, and, and like very sensitive? Tiny. Like very yeah. sensitive. Yeah. The like, throttle. Like you can't like kind of ease into, uh, you know. Like it's ready to go. Yeah. What, so what motor is in this? Is this, it's a stock too? Yeah. It's, so, well, so the motor is an S55, right? Like earlier generation, like 335, stuff like that. I think they had, you know, like the N54 or whatever. Yeah. yeah like that. And obviously the previous generation M3 had a V8, naturally aspirated V8, the S65. Uh, um, so how many liters is this? I don't even remember. I want to say like maybe a three two or something like that. I, I don't. I don't remember. But and it's a straight six. Or? Yeah, it's a, a six cylinder twin turbo S fifty five, and then uh, it's a pretty solid power plant. Uh, but like a lot of cars, it does have its Achilles heel. So like you know, it's no issue. Um, I think a lot of them are more known in uh, in DCT cars uh, over manual six speed manual cars. But basically. When you start adding power mods to the car, uh, you know, there have been reports of, you know, people spinning the bearing um, the, or the, the, the crank hub. Jeez. And uh, when that happens, there's really kind of two situations. There's, there's two outcomes that you're going to have. One, uh, if you spin it and you're lucky, you'll just have to replace the crank hub or it can cause further damage leading to a rebuild, which obviously, you know, would be a lot more expensive. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of things, uh, you know, one thing, it kind of reminds me of like uh, earlier model, like water-cooled Porsches had what was called a IMS bearing failure, yeah. intermediate shaft bearing. Um, and uh, it was a known issue that, you know, same thing. It, like, you know, if, if um, you know, uh, I think it was more prevalent in cars that sat for a really long time. You know, cars with like extremely low mileage. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but basically it could do the same thing. It's like you could either, if it were to fail, you might just have to replace the bearing or it could cause a rebuild. It's kind of a very similar situation. But um, what I think people need to take into consideration is that um, when you hear about people spinning their crank cup, you know, what you need to ask or take into consideration is what are their driving habits? You know, are these people that are constantly, you know, downshifting and stuff like that? You know, I think what, what would be like, you know, kind of a cause for it to fail is say you're in, you know, fifth gear, you have it in manual mode, you accidentally hit the paddle twice and drop it into third, and it over revs the car like super high, I think. So there's no safety measure pretty at that point? I mean, the car's got an ECU and everything, yeah. and for the most part, you can't necessarily, I guess, over rev it, but like you can still have it in the really high RPM range that could potentially cause that problem. Um, so I think that is definitely something that people need to take into consideration when they also, you know, when they hear about crank hub failure. Um, and then also, um, when you're mindful of it, and you know that's what causes it, you know, when you're driving, just keep those things in mind. Try not to, you know, have it sitting super high in RPMs for a very long time. Definitely not. But aside from that, I mean, these cars respond really well to, like, modifications, power modifications. Like, for example, this car um, has just intake, you know, full exhaust and tune, and I don't like to guess power numbers, but I will say that it definitely reminds me pretty closely of, you know, the, the 911 Turbo that I had. The 996? Yeah, the 996. That's crazy, because that thing was fast. Yeah, that thing was pretty fast. And it, it was, was all-wheel drive. That was, was the main a, difference, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the feeling was different. You know, when you punch in the 911 Turbo, it's all-wheel drive. It has pretty wide You're tires. You're just It plants and just pulls. Yeah. Um, whereas this car, you know, it's rear-wheel drive, and you kind of have to be careful. You know, when I first got the car and I was kind of learning you know, how to drive it and stuff. Not how to drive it, but just getting used to the car and, you know, how power delivery comes in and everything. I quickly found out in second gear, if you're doing like, you know, 30, 40 miles an hour and you punch it in second gear, it will spin the wheels and definitely kind of get away from you. But luckily these cars are overall pretty easy to kind of correct. Um, so and, you guys got some good tires on Yeah, so, you know, it, it does have Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's in the back. You love those um, tires. 
Yeah, and then I have um, Super Sports in the front because that's, you know, what was on there when I got it. So I wanted to kind of keep it all the same. But um, yeah, they're all, you know, really good sticky compound, like kind of summer tires. Um, and overall, I think it works, you know, really well. But um, right now we're cruising. I have it in M1 mode. Uh, in M1 right now, it's just like in like automatic mode but it's also like the car's driving itself. Like I don't have to worry about shifting it or anything. But if I hit M2, it actually, uh, like on my car, it uh, turns off traction control and then now you, you just manually shift. So, um, you know, like you just, you can hit it on the paddles or you can shift down here in the shifter. So that is fourth. Crackling. So as you can hear, it does have a lot of burble. Yeah, you bourbon, um, so all right. So we're doing about maybe Whiskey, 60 miles an hour, and we're going to go ahead and go wide open throttle now. Pretty angry. But I love the way it sounds. Um, I think between, with the combination of the intakes and the Catless downpipes, I mean the full exhaust, I'm sure the midpipe, J-pipe help as well, but like especially intakes, downpipe, and with the tune, you know, the, the boost is kind of turned a little bit higher, you can definitely hear the turbo spool. Jeez. But honestly, I mean, aside from just, you know, kind of occasionally getting on it, I just cruise in this car. Um, just because, you know. What's the suspension on it? Uh, so the car is lowered on H&R Super Sport lowering springs. Okay, so, okay. So it lowered it 1.6 inches up front and 1 inch in the back. But okay. honestly, I have, uh, you know, a couple friends with these cars. And uh, my one buddy has an F80 and it's on a, a very commonly uh common brand i guess amongst the f8x group um whether it's f80 or f82 m3 or m4 um it's called they're, they're called emd springs and it usually lowers it like a really good amount like no wheel gap sometimes it even like has like a slight tuck um and uh this car is lowered on h&r um h &R's super a good sport. brand yeah h&r's a german springs. brand isn't it yeah. Is it okay? And Ibach too, right? Ibach and I don't know if Ibach is. Mm -hmm. But like, um, I know that you know with the lowering springs, it lowered it a pretty good amount. I normally like it a little bit lower, and to kind of give it a little bit more of like lower a it always looks better. But when it's functional, yeah, it's, it, it, you have it to compromise. Yeah. Because the thing is, is you know, I think it looks perfect uh, the way it yeah, is now. Yeah, I think, I think, and it rides good. What really helped is that. So I added a set of wheel spacers to kind of give it a little bit more of like an aggressive stance, I guess you could say. Uh, and I could go a little more aggressive, especially because like the front, the car is not that low. Um, and currently, I have um, you know the 20-inch competition wheels on it, and I, and I have five millimeter spacers in the back. Um, 15 in the front, but I could technically probably bump it up to like maybe 20, 25, and maybe go 10, 15 in the back. Maybe 12. 15 might be pushing it. I think 12 is probably like the, the closest you would want to go to just have it like super flush. Um, but yeah, I mean, normally I like it slower, but like you said, I mean, um, it is kind of nice to you know, be able to pull out of my driveway since we're in a new construction community. There's like a pretty steep lip on, um, you know, coming out of the driveway. And, you know, it's always kind of a pain in the butt when you have to... I think I saw you go straight out. You never go straight out. Yeah, normally you got to come <laughs> out at an angle and stuff. So obviously you don't, you know, destroy, you know, your front lip or, yeah. you know, um, stuff underneath the car. But, you know, with this car, I can pretty much pull straight out and, it, you know, it won't have a problem. So what's really cool is uh, if you guys hear that, you know, the, the kick down, you know, that's actually automatic. You know, I'm not, I'm not shifting anything. I'm just leaving it in drive. I'm not. You just let off. You just the, go. The pedals it automatically, um, you know, is is doing the downshift and everything to me. And yeah, it does have burble. Um, 
I'm not necessarily a, uh, a fan of it, um, but you know, the car do does actually have a pretty good amount of burble, even like from the factory, these cars have burble. Um, Sounds just like you're playing uh, uh, Forza Horizon. Yeah, I guess some cars. Horizon's do. got that burble. Yeah. What was the other game I played? Was it Need for Speed? Oh, Need for Speed Heat. Oh, they, really? They put burbles in there hardcore. Yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, I, I don't I don't understand it really, but um, it does have it. Mm. And it's definitely really prevalent in, like, when you have it in, like, manual mode. Yeah. And, uh... Um, you're you're manually shifting it, but you can still hear it in the 